This is the Dr. Lember Podcast, episode number 167, originally recorded November 22nd, 2020. I am Brett, and this podcast, myself, Liam Leach, and Anne Humphrey got together for a podcast focused on the producer, John Wiles. Well, actually, this all came about when we did our Gunfighters uh, podcast. In fact, this is the second half of to the Gunfighters uh, podcast. Yes, in this podcast, we sit down and we dissect the John Wiles, uh, although shortly lived, very interesting era of the, as the producer of Doctor Who. Again, he came right after Verdi Lambert, just before Ennis Lloyd. We did a air comparison in a previous podcast, I believe it was like 96 or something like that, going, you know, putting two eras against each other, the Verdi Lambert era and the Ennis Lloyd era, and we skipped over this because we didn't think it was that interesting. However, once we started getting into the gunfighters, we found that that was the exact opposite. The, Ver- the John Wiles era was very fascinating. We have lots of sound from a convention in 1986 that uh, Legion found, as well as some uh, audio from the Gunfighters documentary. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. I will tell you, it may be a little um, controversial at points, but uh, I hope you enjoy, and now to the podcast. So moving on to from this to the producer of the, well, he saw through the story, the, the Gunfighters, John Wiles. Again, this is just fascinated me beyond all belief. Uh, w- again, So the show notes for the gunfighters kind of turned me on to this. And then I saw the documentary that is on um, the gunfighters and I was just amazed by it. So let's, let's break this down. The neat thing about John Wiles is we can also kind of connect them and talk to revolving around what he did. Similarly to, I guess what Chibnall kind of has done to some extent, if you like really look Mm. close enough, I believe. So here's uh, a first clip I'll play. Donald Wilson's chosen replacement for Verity Lambert was John Wiles, an experienced writer and script editor, but as it turned out, a reluctant producer. He was South African. Uh, He, as it were, fled the apartheid regime. We got on terribly well. He was terribly easy to get on with. Both John Wiles and Donald Tosh came to the show determined to shake things up. He'd worked a lot with children and uh, knew uh, really a lot more about the psychology of children than the other people in the BBC, you know, and they mustn't be too frightened. And he said, absolute rubbish, they love being frightened. And so we really did, you know, begin to kind of turn the screws a little. We wanted to develop the programme and get it out of the somewhat childish rut we felt it was in. It was the boundaries we wanted to extend the most, to push it a little bit more towards adult science fiction, so we could touch subjects that Verity and Dennis hadn't wanted to touch. So, Mm. I thought that was quite intriguing, revolving Mm. around the direction that he wanted the show to go. What was that pulled from, Brett? Documentary on the gunfighters. Ah, right. Um, What's interesting (laughs) is... It's very like uh, Philip Hinchcliffe and Robert Holmes several years later. There's, oh, yeah. You know, the way they're talking is so, so similar. Well, mm. I, and I appreciate the, the, the fact that, you know, I, I, I don't understand. I don't, I don't think it, it was said that he feels as though that, you know, the, the kids like being scared and stuff like that. And what, the first story that I believe he commissioned and, and did was The Myth Makers. We'll find out a little bit later that he basically had no so, part to do with Dalek's master plan. He did The Massacre, followed by The Ark, Celestial Toymakers, or it was actually kind of done by the time The Ark and Celestial Toymakers came around. And then The Gunfighters and The Savages were still under his watch, but he was no longer part of the show. So he he didn't commission... Uh, Mythmakers or Dalek's Master Plan, they were already there. Um, he he had mm. a hand in the Ark and the, uh, the Ark, uh, the Massacre of the Ark, the Celestial Toymaker, Gunfighters and Savages. Uh, that's that's where he he brought it in. Um, he was basically given the reins at the end of Galaxy 4 <laughs> when... Mm-hmm. New heard rumblings that Maureen O'Brien uh, wanted to leave the role. Called her in, basically went, "Okay, you're sacked. You're going at the end of the Mythmakers." Yep, which she was shocked um, at, wasn't she? Apparently, he, yeah, because she did want to leave, no, we'll but to she that. didn't want to leave like that. He, 
then let Dalek's master plan do what it did. He hated it, but he had to do it because it had already been okay. commissioned. Okay, can we talk about the sound that we currently just listened to? Because I have a whole bunch of clips that get into yeah, yeah, yeah. what we're talking about. So, again, the, the direction. He wanted to be a trailblazer. He wanted to take over from Verity Lambert, and he wanted to make his own indelible mark on it, which would be completely different to Verity Lambert. Yes. Which, and again, I think... I, I, I Yeah. No, no, I, I think you're going to say a very similar thing. You, you can appreciate that, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, he's got he's come into a children's what is fundamentally a children's show. Yeah, and it didn't work. It has out. a well, format. And it I has app- a fixed format. What I appreciate about what he did is he realized that you know kids like being scared. And, he, yeah. he, you know, he mm. we need to kind of pander yeah. to not just the children's audience, but a more adult audience and a more, you know, and try to, you know, step it up a level. But yeah. my argument without talking about the, the next up and coming stories that he did, I don't feel as though he actually did. I feel as though he actually took it back a level in some aspects. Mm. I mean, there are aspects of the massacre, which is shocking. But that's oh, the yeah. true historical oh, yeah. historical facts of it. Um, yes, he sort of brought in the idea of the historical as well. The doctor and companion don't take part in the main events. They are just skirting on on the edges, which is what the doctor does during the massacre. You know, he, he's a fascinating, fascinating man because yes, not only, not only is he, you know, a producer who, by this point, in his own words, had shadowed Verity Lambert for six months before he came to the role. So he should know what was happening. He should know how it worked and what the audience is like and what they don't. You know, he's mm-hmm. a novelist. Yes. A screenwriter. Mm-hmm. A director. He's yes. He's got many titles under his cap. And... He doesn't really bring any of them to the table or wasn't allowed to bring any of them to the table for Doctor Who by the higher ups. Uh. Which, I mean, you could almost, again, kind of looking at Chris Chibnall, it's almost like he wants to do stuff and like either the the big uh, BBC is just like, oh, yeah, that's in line with what we want or just... Is mm-hmm. just nodding like a, a psychopath in the corners. Uh-huh. uh-huh Pretty uh-huh. much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. here's the thing then. <laughs> Who would you say was close to the mark? John Wiles or Graham Williams? Ooh. Oh. What what do you mean? Interesting. As in because Interesting. both you know, you, you could argue and say that both kind of eras were sort of comic and they had their you know, comedy elements and stuff, but they were also both very flawed and not particularly liked by fans, I guess. So who who do you feel had more of a grasp of Doctor Who and who do you think pulled their off better? Graham Williams. Yeah. Um, hands down, Graham Williams. Graham Williams left because... You know, he wanted to. John Wiles literally threw his toys out the pram uh. because he couldn't make any any of his marks on the show, and he left. He literally he he resigned. He basically went, "I'm not doing this anymore." Yeah. You know. Well, not only that, um, but you also have the fact where Graham Williams had to take it down. It was basically kind of ordered to take down the macabre uh, aspect of the show. And kind of they were in trouble go, with Mary Wyatt. Yeah, a little bit, exactly. They went to a different yeah. direction. Where at least according to this, Graham Williams or not Graham Williams, John Wiles. I mean, we'll get to a clip in a second. He didn't like the Daleks' master plan, which to me, again, no. I love that sh- s- story. But to me, it is if you want dark. If he is trying to get kids, just like that first clip just said that we just played. If you're trying to get kids to be scared and you are reveling in it and this is what you're kind of doing and you totally hate the Daleks' master plan, 
Well, the Doc's Master Plan just basically did what you said you were going to do. And then yep. we look at the, the stories that you did. You, you see that he did the arc, and we'll get to some other clips. He loves the arc. The arc is horrible. Mm. Yeah. It is not that good. He had the gunfighters the commissioned. The arc is a fascinating one because it's two stories, basically. It's written by two different guys who neither of them knew what the other one was writing. Yeah. It's just, it's an enigma. I mean, I don't, there's, there's an interview with um, Paul, what's his name? Erickson. Paul, who, who, who wrote Erickson? The Ark. Yes, Paul Erickson. Um, American chap. I think he's American. Sounded very Southern. And he he basically said, you know, oh, I wrote the novel for it. And they went, oh, how did that go? He was like, well, you know, the only thing I had access to was an audio recording. Uh, so I sort of made it up as I went along. Uh, wow. And it's like, you know, when you're like, wow. He was like, you know, bits of it I'd never, never heard before. It's a stat. I mean, it's, there's experimental giving, you know, giving two guys, you know, writers credits on a story not getting them to link up and it's just it it boggles the mind indeed but before he could take over as producer john was would have to trail verity lambert for a few months during which time several stories would be commissioned for the show's next season whether he liked them or not in the meantime, William Ems delivered his scripts for Galaxy 4. The story itself was awfully thin, uh, and we couldn't think what else to do with it. By this, I mean, you know, we, we had inherited it, and, and it had all been approved. And so we just kind of ran along with it. The last story credited to Verity Lambert would be Mission to the Unknown, a single episode not featuring any of the regular cast, but instead concentrating on the dastardly Daleks as a prelude to the forthcoming 12-part Dalek story. What 12-part Dalek story, I hear you ask? What we did not know was that Verity had already commissioned a 12-part Dalek. Johnny was furious, uh, quite reasonably. I mean, we should have been told, at least, but we were presented with it as a fait accompli. John Wiles had a similar reaction, considering it... An enormous rock in the middle of the sea, and one on which any boat we were going to run would be submerged. It was handed to me by Verity and Dennis. Donald and I virtually washed our hands of it, and it went on, more or less without us, in the hands of Dennis Spooner, who did most of the writing, and Douglas Camfield. I was nominally in charge, but I had absolutely no authority. So, wow. to me, that just kind of shows just... I, I, I understand. When you are the showrunner, you want to be in charge of it all. You want to have your grand schemes. You have this plan or whatever. But to me, the thing that's just baffling to me is he shadows Verdi for, what, six months, did it say? A six few weeks? months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's six, was six it? to eight months. Six to eight yeah. months. He was unaware of a 12-part Dalek story, and you're shadowing her for mm. that mm -hmm. long? How can you not and know? And then to... Exactly. Uh, how can you be kept in the dark unless you're just... You're, you're tuned out altogether. And so you have this, and then you have, again, to me, the greatest first Doctor story ever, Dalek's Master Plan. And it did what exactly he wanted it to do, but he washed his hands of it. You know what? I, I'm not going to do anything about it. Who cares? Like, really? He. Um... Just, it might not be a part of your grand scheme, but to just sit it out. Mm. Well, there's, there's an interview with him where he they, they go to him, oh, what do you think to the Daleks' master plan scripts? And he was like, I didn't read them. Uh -huh. You know, I literally washed my hands off it. Dennis Spooner took full charge of that one. Yeah. Very strange. And, you know, well, I, I don't know. I mean, as I said, if you're going to do that and then just go, ah, well, I, I had no mm. part on it, well, then I'm sorry, but you've got nothing to complain about because you walked. You mm -hmm. know? So. Right, yeah. His loss. 
But viewers would have to wait for their Dalek action. Before that would come the first story commissioned by John Wiles and Donald Tosh, an adventure set during the Trojan War called The Mythmakers. The Mythmakers I absolutely loved. We had a wonderful cast. For the first three episodes, it's high farce. And then, in part four, everyone gets brutally massacred. It's a very enjoyable comedy where the Doctor's interplay with the DCC is something we all laugh at. That had all sorts of nice humorous edges to it. But then suddenly it all turns on, 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 on a razor's edge and suddenly everybody's killed and it becomes extremely nasty. There's a strange mix um, in these stories of, of comedy and horror often almost side by side. Kids love, love to laugh and they love being frightened. It wasn't so much a really conscious decision. It was just that one was enjoying oneself and, and this was sort of part of the mix. The Mythmakers would also see the shocked departure of the Doctor's companion, Vicky. No one would be more shocked than the actress who played her. We went off on our six week break. When I came back, I expected to find the next four scripts waiting for me, and there weren't any scripts. The writing out of Vicky is one of the things I really regret about my time in uh, Doctor Who, because it was unfortunately so badly handled. I really was desperate to leave. If they had offered me another contract, you know, for however many episodes, I might have been torn, because even um, 50 quid a week, which wasn't a great fortune even in those days. Well, all right. So, what are our thoughts revolving around what we learned about revolving around the myth um, makers, it, Dalek's master plan, writing out of Vicky? It didn't really say how or why she left. Um, it sounded like there was going to be, gonna, gonna be she, more, to, more to that than well, there was. Well, she... she she wanted to leave. She said she had been leaving hints that she wanted to leave. And so Donald Tosh, the script editor, wrote her out. Mm. I, I cut out parts of it because it was basically Donald Tosh just kind of apologizing, saying, oh, I, you know, I basically handled that badly. I probably shouldn't have done that. But you know what? When you're leaving hints that you want to leave the show and then they let you leave the show... You know, to Maureen O'Brien, like, I'm sorry, you have no reason to be upset when you're just like, you know what, I want to move on. I, I want to move on. And then when you get allowed to be moved on, what, uh, 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 but, uh, uh, what, huh? This was, uh, uh, I wasn't expecting this. And then she says if she would have been offered a second contract. Well, people don't read minds. No. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't know. I can see both sides of the, the coin. I think what they should have done is they should have taken Maureen O'Brien aside and said, we've heard you've been, you know, dropping hints. Do you want to leave? You know, do you want to leave straight away or can you hang on for I don't know, X number of episodes? And, you know, they should have communicated with her better than that i think that's where the error is the fact that they didn't have a dialogue with her and confirm it properly rather than just going on hints and rumors and oh yeah but i will say having which... done two previous uh era comparison or not gear comparisons you know the highlights and lowlights of the first and second doctor's era i mean that's just the bbc in a nutshell the lack of communicating see i think they handled they got better over the years i think the way they, they handled polly and ben's leaving was considerably better they didn't just go you're leaving yeah. they went you're leaving on this episode your contract goes until this episode we're still gonna pay you yeah and then when it came to annika wills they're just like we would like you to stick around and she said no if he goes, I go. Not that Which is so, yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. As this was almost John Wiles' first decision as producer, it didn't exactly get his relationship with William Hartnell off to a good start. I know Bill was furious. He really didn't want that to happen. Bill, I think, was very upset. I mean, I can remember him saying to me, he said, oh, this is outrageous, I'm not going to have this. I got on very well with Bill. 
but he and Johnny fought like cat and dog whenever they met. I know he didn't like John Wiles. I know that he, he fell out very badly with him. Johnny was careful, but really it was judo. It was all sorts of... It, 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 there was an electric current between those two, always. I can remember Bill being quite... He could be quite acidic and vitriolic, and I can remember saying, that bloody man, Wiles, he's done... And he, was re he really was giving it some... I can't remember what it was about. So... What used to happen, if there were things, trouble with Bill, I would have to deal with it. It was OK, fine, Donald, down you go to the rehearsal rooms, have a quiet chat with Bill while he's having his lunch. If they couldn't get me, if I was doing something else in a way, uh, then Johnny had to go and deal with it. Eventually, my directors devised a code for me. They would turn to their PA and say, you'd better phone the designer, which meant get John down here quick. <laughs> So, that's just an interesting, uh, I mean, you know, granted, sometimes the talent does not get along with the producer, executive producer, or whatever, but that's just an, mm. all kind of stemming from the, how they handled Maureen O'Brien, but also, I, I'm kind of curious if William Hartnell already just didn't like him just mm. to begin with. He didn't like change, did he? Bill no, Hartnell was no. a big stickler. Plus, stickler. Um, he, he change. Plus, he uh, uh, from what uh, from what you well from what they said in the documentary, he was escaping the apartheid in South Africa, so he probably had tensions there too. Well, no, not really. No, uh. John Wiles was a white man. Oh, was he? Of, uh... Okay. Uh, oh, I just yeah. thought there might be some sort, you know, some racial element there because of no, what no, no. Bill was like so. No, I don't think that had anything to do with it. I just think it's the fact that somebody came along, tipped up the apple cart, and Bill Hartnell didn't like it. Mm. And uh... But Wiles, by the sounds of it, didn't help the situation. Oh, no. Because, uh, you know, he... Right, you know, whereas if someone had gone in, you know, gently and, and discussed things with Bill, again, Bill would probably have been perfectly all right with it. It is the fact that... But then, God then again... His... <laughs> We, you know, we know from interviews that wouldn't have been. You, you couldn't no. just discuss things through with Bill Hartnell. No. It's a story Sidney Newman tells, and Dennis Spooner uses it. And Dennis Spooner was like, "How do I deal with deal with Bill Hartnell when he's, you know, throwing his toys out the pram?" And Sidney Newman basically went. So, for example, one story he he refused to do a scene with a chair. So I went to him, Bill Hartnell. You know, do, do you know who used this chair? You know, this was used in 1922 in Hamlet. Uh, you know, why Why is it, you know, such and such a great actor used it? And Bill Hartnell was like, oh, you know, oh, you know, I, I, if, I, if I could be, you know, like them, then that's fine. I'll use the chair. Mm. And it's, it's <laughs> you had to walk on eggshells with Bill Hartnell, from what I understand. Mm. And you had to sort of manipulate. You had to make him think it was his idea and it would be beneficial towards him before he'd do anything. I mean, we all know he was an irascible old soul. John Wiles was the mm -hmm. first producer that coined the idea of getting rid of him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll get to that in a second. But you could, uh, to me, John Wiles, at some, to some extent, kind of reminds me of JNT when it came to Tom Baker. You know, by this time, mm. Tom Baker, uh, you know, even though this is mid third season, or this is. He takes over in Galaxy 4 in the, th the third season, and he starts putting his um, mark on the show with Myth Makers, and then, of course, he doesn't get his way with uh, Dalek's master plan. But he's trying to make his mark on the show. He kind of isn't allowed to, but then you have the, the, the star of the show is the star head figure that you need to keep happy. Yeah. And you can kind of see the same thing with Tom Baker and JNT, where mm -hmm. Tom Baker mm -hmm. had been doing it for so long, and JNT just says, hey, you know all that comedy stuff? We're, we're taking it all out. And in that point, JNT had just barely been hired, and he it was just and Tom Baker is just like, hey, then I'm not going to sign a contract. And instead of playing a game that Tom Baker was allowed to get away with in years past, where they'd be like, oh no, please, you know, please sign a contract. Like the BBC and JNT were just like, okay, mm -hmm. we'll find somebody else. Yeah, yeah. And Tom Baker was not allowed to play the game anymore. No. 
Yeah. Katarina Bryan, yeah. the production team introduced Adrienne Hill as Katarina, a handmaiden from ancient Troy, which seemed like a good idea at the time. I think it was assumed that Adrienne was going to be the continuation. She was going to be the next, um, the, the next girl companion for some time. And they realised very quickly that they had a problem because Adrienne was from Troy. We suddenly realised the huge problems we would have in having somebody who came from that far back in history, everything will always have to be explained to her. And it was going to be a nightmare. You know, that's why she, she goes. After having been whipped up into a frenzy of excitement by Mission to the Unknown, many viewers could be forgiven for wondering where the Daleks had got to. But they wouldn't have much longer to wait as the TARDIS touched down in the jungle. Hmm. So... Do, what are your thoughts revolving around? Because I've always kind of wondered how far, because we do have Mark in the current Big Finish Fifth Doctor series. He's also Aramem Mark as well. Mark is kind mm. of around the same time of, yeah, and and Aramem. And, and Aramem's before Yeah, exactly. Troy. And so Aramem's was way it, before Troy. Was it, it, was it the writers unable uh, to write the character properly or are Big Finish just trying to, or did Big Finish, uh, when it came to Aramum and Mark, just be like, okay, these people kind of get it. Let's just go on with the story. Things do not have to be all magical and whatever. Because, you know, Katarina is constantly, during the first couple episodes of the Dalek, she thinks she's dead. She, you know, everything is magical. Everything is this. Everything is a single that. They could still have the same problem with Aramum and Mark. However, is it mm. the character of Eric and Mark, or uh, Aramim and Mark, is it the character that allowed them to do this compared to Katarina, or do you think it was just the writing at the time? Uh, I think, mm. um, for, well, if you look, certainly at Aramim, Mark I'm less familiar with, I haven't listened to the stories as thoroughly, but Aramim, they did a very sensible thing in that they had the eye of the scorpion, and then they dropped her in 17th century France, which was different by a long way. But there were certain things that were the same. I, a lot of people still used swords and things like that that she was familiar with. Yes, she, there was gunpowder and things, which were rather a shot to the system. But there were things there that she, you know, knew what they were. It wasn't... in. You know, it wasn't all futuristic machines. Also, and, don't forget, you know, though, too, of computers. her position. She was a queen, or she was in line to be pharaoh, whereas Katerina was just a handmaiden. So, from the off, Eremem okay, was going to be... Let's a... look at Mark, though. Um, this is true. Uh, I, I knew you were going to say that. I, I just think that it was partially down to the character. That was her character, unfortunately, that she wasn't the brightest bulb in the, you know, in the, in the box. And that big finish, you know, were, you know, are able to write for the most part characters better. So I think it was mm. partially down to, you know, her, her level of intelligence and also the writers not knowing what to do with her because there was nothing to say that, that, that they could have gone away. There could have been a gap, you know, like between the gap from... Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, what was the story before? The, the, the Censorites. He's married. The Aztecs. Yeah, the Aztecs, Aztecs. And, and the Censorites. Aztecs. And, you know, they say in the first scene, oh, yeah, well, we've been together for X amount of time now and we're, you know, we're, we're, we're getting on, blah, 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 blah. If they'd really wanted to, they could have done that and they could have progressed her character so that she was still inquisitive and still curious, but she was, you know, they'd explain things to her and that she wasn't so paranoid about, you know, that, oh, she's actually dead and all that, you know. So I I just think it was yes. just bad writing and they literally just didn't, didn't know what to do with her. I, I think the way that Katerina is written in Daughter of the Gods is fascinating. Oh, yeah. Compared to how she's in Dalek's Master Plan. Hmm. 
Well, she's had time to grow in Daughter of the Gods, though, compared to where she yeah. was in Dalek's Master Plan. But I will say, yeah. to me, in getting the BBCs back, or at least the writing back or whatever, I, I don't think it is their fault necessarily or the writing's fault because the practice at the time was to get the audience engaged in the following episode. You can kind of see where, and, and you know, to me, the sense rise to me kind of is like one of those like little asterisk type of a thing because usually we, we've gone from one episode to the next episode dating back to the er, er, unearthly child. We then go to the Daleks, then we have the edge of destruction followed by landing on in Marco Polo. I mean, all of these stories are one after the other after the other, and I believe the main reason why they did that is they wanted the audience to come back just because they're done with that story that story arc or whatever. We need to tease the next story. We need to, you know, ooh, hey, there's a, a mysterious uh, the TARDIS is surrounded in snow. Ooh, this is interesting. Next up, roof of the world. I mean, it, it was to mm. drive the audience to want to return to the next week, even though the story as seen is all wrapped up. And so I don't think that it is the actual writing's fault for Katarina's, you know, they, they could have done what the sense rights is, but that wasn't like, I guess you could say kind of in the books to that extent. And also with the sense rights, they've already had six stories of adventures together and maybe perhaps the the ratings were like uh, you know doing okay or the audience was kind of enjoying it however i will say looking at the ratings after the aztecs the sense right story imme- immediately dropped right afterwards and so you could almost see that perhaps what they did at least the story with the sense rights or just that kind of uh, affected things and it kind of mirrors itself in Galaxy 4. Galaxy 4 was great. It was received well. Mission of the Unknown was received well. Myth Makers was received quite well. Then you get Dalek's Master Plan, and then the drop happens mm. for Massacre. And perhaps, what what did they do? Did they? It, was it the story of the Massacre that wasn't that good? Or was it... The, the, the lack of connection between the two that didn't have the audience wanting to come back, is that what happened? I mean, it's, mm. I mean th- there's lots of aspects and avenues to look at why Katarina didn't work out, but I don't want to blame the writing for it. I just believe that that's just the way that TV was back then. No, I, I get that. Um... As a result, the burden of carrying the show would increasingly fall onto Peter Purvis's shoulders. I had a huge respect for Peter as an actor. He was absolutely solid as a rock, frequently at the last minute, because Bill would suddenly cut something, and you'd think, nobody is going to understand the next episode at all unless this line goes in. So one would slide down onto the floor and very quietly slip a note to Peter and say something like, well, one which was written, for goodness sake, mention dung, 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 whatever. Uh, he would. Uh, it would just suddenly kind of come out. It, it seemed fairly natural. We knew that, um, as it were, the writing was on the wall as far as Bill was concerned. And why we were experimenting with ways to change him. You know, how do you do it? As the months had gone by, William Hartnell's relationship with producer John Wiles had gone from bad to worse. One day I got a call from the studio to say that all the dresses had come out on strike. Now this was a cataclysmic start to a day in the studio where you depend on all your backup all the time. Bill had simply offended his dresser, who then complained and so the entire staff had walked out. And this was on the one day you had to get an episode recorded. John, I can remember on one occasion going absolutely berserk because we were just we, we'd collapse in hysterics on the set. I think Gene Marsh and I and Billy Hart were all absolutely wrecked. Peter Butterworth was there at the same time, and John, I can remember coming screaming out of the gallery, saying, Look, "Will you concentrate? Will you?" <laughs> A reluctant producer at the best of times, John Wiles was now feeling the strain. They kept on saying things like, "You've got to." save this amount of money or lose that or do the other. And he felt hugely restricted because, you know, there is the budget, I mean, which was small enough anyway, um, 
and for it to be perpetually being mucked about with other people telling him what he could and couldn't do in it. He just felt, you know, life is too short. I've got... Hmm. Here, here's a question, just listening to that. Do you think John Wiles was just not able or equipped to be a producer for the show Doctor Who? Sounds like it. Yes. Yeah, yeah I would agree. Yeah. I would. I mean, let's be honest, it's, it was one of his first main producing roles, from what I can understand, uh, if not his first producing role. And it yeah. was just... He he didn't help because he was very wet behind the ears. Um, <laughs> he had the irascible Bill Hartnell to deal with. Yeah. He had stories already pre-approved that he had no dealing with. Whenever he went in to make a change, the BBC went, yeah, that's nice now. Um, you know, so on yeah. and so forth. So really, if you look at it, it's kind of surprising it even can continue past what it did, really, with all that mm. went on, because it could have ended there. All right, so I'm going to play two clips back to back. Um, this is from the, uh, one of the things that Liam or Legion sent me. This was from an interview, or a panel in 1986, featuring um, oh, who was it featuring? Uh, Paul Erickson, uh, which who wrote the Ark. It also featured, obviously, what was 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 this the one with William M's? Was oh no, no, this is Dennis no, Spooner, it's Dennis and Spooner. also, yeah, this is Dennis Spooner. And, okay, so I'm going to play two clips back to back. So, seems to be in all your stories, John, something rather unusual in each of them. I mean, you never got a sort of straightforward uh, beginning and ending, and that that was it. You know, a companion got killed or or the TARDIS materialized in the same place again. Was that all deliberate? I mean, did you? How much input did you actually give to each of the stories that you were concerned with? Taking over from this majestic personality of Verity Lambert, um, who established very much, very firmly, her own stamp upon it, um, and her relationship with Bill was so very fixed, uh, and she had worked so very, very closely with Dennis, that when I moved in with my story editor, um, with my own particular ideas, and as I say, I fretted about this, the shape of the shoe, and tried to exhibit my and demonstrate my own weirdness, right? And I think I was everything that Verity had said, black. I wasn't actually going to say, well, it's white, but I wanted to play around with shades of grey. And I had, um, and I'm sorry we haven't been able to trace Donald Tosh, who was my story editor. And I've talked about him before. He was a great character. And f you think I talk fast and get excited. By God, Donald actually outstripped me. And he'd wave his hands and shout and carry on and never draw breath and would bowl me along with the great things of enthusiasm and introduce me to poets that he wanted us to read. All kinds of weird people came to the lunch and ate my food. And I, couldn't, I can't remember who most of them were, but um, most of them didn't even know why they were there, except Donald felt they ought to come in on the program. So yes, a bit weird. Uh, and then I found that I couldn't actually get it to go the way I wanted. So then when I left, it left it all rather hanging in the air when Innes took over. So when you write, because you're also you know, a well-known writer, do you tend to write stories that have messages to them rather than simply entertainment? Um, I, I, I'm one of those awful people who has to write something to find out what I'm writing about. This is very boring if you're writing a 100,000-word novel. Because having written it, you think, Christ, I haven't, I, you haven't said anything I thought I was going to say. Um, uh, and there may very well be a message, and, and, I, and I'm not really particularly proud of this, and I certainly don't do it deliberately. The people I envy mostly, and I wish I were like, were the people like Dennis, who um, work absolutely practically, and I don't mean anything by disparagement. I, you know, I think to work like that, to a, a, what a format, where you say what you're going to say, and you sell it, and you go home with the check, and you're not waffling around like me saying, oh, well, the whole thing was a waste of time. I think that uh, it's a, a marvelous way of working, and I haven't got it. All mm. right, so the, those are two uh, snippets from, uh, again, a convention, a panel that uh, John Wiles was on in 1986. What are your thoughts from what he said? Um, it just kind of affirms things, really, that, you know, he... he uh, yeah. it just struggled really in that role. Um, but you know, at least he's kind of honest about it. He basically went, Doctor. From what what I get from that uh, interview is, he he works in a very fluid way. 
you know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Doctor Who's very structural way. And it wasn't right That's for him. not the way he works. Yeah. Yeah. I just think it's interesting that he writes a story not knowing where he's going to go with the no. story. And then if he, mm. if there's a message in there, it's in there. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, it's interesting that he doesn't seem to sort of hold any animosity towards the show, which which is nice. But as you say, it, it is it is a bit it is a bit baffling his way of working and writing. He um he says later on in the, the interview that you know <laughs> when no, he left Doctor Who, I think I might have the a... BBC. Oh, okay, Fine. I might. Yeah, here here's a clip. Yeah. Um, he's asking you, John, if you'd ever consider producing Doctor Who again. Oh, <laughs> I'm not the person to ask for that. No, I, I don't think I'd ever, ever likely to happen again. Um, and I left the BBC many years ago, 20 years ago, a long, long, long time. And um, I don't think for a moment uh, in their wildest dreams they would ever think of taking me back or asking me to come back. It's not the kind of job one would ask for. Uh, and I'm quite sure, and I'm, I'm now a long way out of touch with the technicalities. I think things have changed so much. Um, they've got very nasty, and I, I know that. It's, it's now an absolute jungle, and I'm warned never to go anywhere near television centre. It's, it's so, so dangerous. Uh, they stab you with an idea, and you know, before you can turn around. Um, but I wouldn't be able to cope technically. And it was never, uh, uh, as I've said before, it was never my kind of thing. Um, I didn't like being a producer. I wanted to direct. I wanted to get closer to the floor uh, and work with the actors because I, I was brought up in the theatre and I love working with actors. But my boss actually brought me further away from the floor and put me in this in this position of, of sort of overriding everybody and leading the team. Um, it's it's um, an unlikely situation. Although the strange thing is you actually do like uh, myth stories because I know you've done... Lords of Darkness or Lords yes, of something? Yes, yes. The, the, yes I, 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 love, I love working with ideas. This thing of where do the ideas come from. I think the interesting thing um, is that you can't force an interest in a subject. Do you find that? I remember one of our writers, a man called Vincent Tilsley. Do you remember Vincent? Again, it, 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 he almost sounds like the reluctant producer. Like he didn't even yeah. want the mm-hmm. job. Donald Tosh said, and Dennis Spooner and loads of people that interviewed about him basically say he was a lovely, lovely man to work with. But just Doctor Who was wrong. You know, him. Doctor Who was wrong for him. Yeah. Same thing with Chris Chibnall, right? Mm. <laughs> Doctor mm. Who's wrong. For him. <laughs> we. Hey, um, so develop with her. We had sort of lost that grandfatherly element. He was just becoming really a crotchety old man. And we hoped that by, as it were, giving him someone to be more even grandparental about, it might, you know, soften some of the crotchetiness. Dodo's debut story, The Ark, by Paul Erickson, was one of the first stories commissioned by John Wiles and one close to his heart. The one about the spaceship on its way to another planet. That story was mine, at least from the conceptual point of view. I had this idea of an enormous ship that was so big you could get the whole of South London into it. You could drive cars, ride bicycles, the whole notion of forests floating in the air. Johnny could see all sorts of potential in it. I would have probably, if it had been totally up to me, I probably wouldn't have ever done it. But I knew Johnny loved it and he'd gone along with me for things which I'm sure he would have normally kind of thought, Tom, are you sure we should be doing this? But he'd allowed me to go ahead. So um, this, this was his, so ahead we went with it. A very nice director called Michael Imerson was actually fired in the gallery as the last episode was about to be recorded. I think it was partially because the arc was such a badly executed piece. I mean, it was it, not his fault. I think it showed in the design, the costume designs were awful. It just didn't work as a piece, and it's a pity because it was a very good story. But immediately after that, suddenly we had a new producer, and uh, he was introduced to us. This is the new producer, and I met in this Lloyd. Like Jay- hmm. So... Uh... And to me, this is, again, when we start talking about this, why I kind of want to connect John Wiles with Chris Chibnall, because you have this arc, you have the script editor, Donald Tosh, basically saying that this is not a good story. In fact, I probably wouldn't 
want to go through with this, but because I like you as a friend, like we'll do it. It's mm. one of those things where shouldn't a friend mm. just step in and just be like, hey, nah, you know what? This actually is not going to work. It's it, it's an the, sorry, continue. The thing with the arc is the story itself is brilliant. But I can appreciate I, I've heard the audio version, you know, the the the, the uh, described version with Peter Purvis narrating it. And um, the concept, the story itself is brilliant. It's a really good story. But the reason it probably was so bad was, you know, it was too ambitious for, um, you TBC. know, the effects of the day. Mm. Yeah, exactly. If it, had, you know, if it had been an audio story or a novel, then it, you know it would have probably been so much better received because as, as an audio story, it works incredibly well. But I can appreciate visually, it was probably awful. Well, I mean, to me, the the, the part that the the excerpt that they played from one of uh, John Wiles's quote that he just oh let's have like a, a floating South. London, you know, where people can play soccer and drive cars. That's not an interesting story. No. That's an idea. Yeah. But if you're going to build a story around, oh, wouldn't it be neat that it just, you know, and it's in space. Oh, and I'm doing a show revolving around science fiction and stuff like that. That, that should work. I mean, uh, it's mm. never more evident than... I mean, granted, the the massacres um, ratings dropped from it started out at eight million to ending at five point eight, and then the arc started at five point five, and actually it got better. It went six point nine, six point two, and ending at seven point three. Mm. Well, the reason why it does, I think, is. As I say, it's a it would have been a pretty shitty story visually, but as as a concept, you know, rather than because the first it's almost two stories in one the arc, because the first two episodes actually ask a fundamental question, you know, Dodo has a cold and the society of year dot in the future whenever the story is set has eradicated the cold virus, so it actually raises a very good point that if you were you know. What happens to the immune system if a, if something that we take as just a simple cold is eradicated and then mm. several thousand years later someone gets it? What happens? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, very interesting. So it asks some very good good questions, that story. He was introduced to us, this is the new producer, and I met Innes Lloyd. Like John was before him, Innes Lloyd had no experience as a producer but had worked as a director. Lloyd also shared his predecessor's enthusiasm, or lack of it, at the appointment. The BBC said to me, do you want to produce Doctor Who? To which I said, no, thank you very much. I come here to be a director. And anyway, I don't like science fiction. I felt I should probably carry on. And then I met Innes. And Innes's idea uh, for Doctor Who and mine were miles apart. I mean, he wanted to go down pure science fiction and absolutely sort of, you know, the whole thing becomes sort of mathematical formula. And so I said, well, I'm terrified. I, I, I think I should, you know, move on. I suppose the odd thing uh, about uh, Johnny Wells as producer and me as editor is the fact that we did agree so much. Um, we, I, I, I can't remember any, I don't think there was any major argument ever before deciding to leave, John Waz and Donald Tosh had already laid plans for the show to continue without William Hartnell. The writing out of Bill we knew was going to have to happen because he just wasn't coping. They'd planned to write him out in the next story, The Celestial Toymaker. John Waz's idea was that the Doctor would be rendered invisible, only to magically reappear, played by a different actor. I mean, technically, how it was going to be done, I have no idea. But we would sort of buffer one into the other somehow. But as the Celestial Toymaker went into production, Innes Lloyd was already in the producer's chair, and Jerry Davis had been appointed to replace Donald Tosh as script editor. He was full of ideas, which 
matched up with what Innes wanted to do with the thing, which I thought was dead wrong for the programme. The Celestial Time Maker had been thought up by writer Brian Hales. The whole thing was going to be a real scare fest with jokes. And within a week, he came back to and said, I can't write this, I'm frightening myself, he said. I can't, I cannot do this. Because it was to do with playing with people's minds. And so, in keeping with tradition of outgoing script editors, Donald Tosh was asked to write the story himself. I went away and duly wrote it, and uh, Johnny read it and loved it. Then I took my first holiday for two years while Jerry was being was moving himself in. One of Jerry Davis's first acts as script editor would be to scrap the Toymaker script and start all over again. The content was a sort of pseudo-smart and old-coward comedy, which was wrong for the audience, but we had to salvage something. I had to sit down in the garden and dash out and act a day. The Toymaker character suggested toys, which suggested nursery, and I played around with something sinister on those lines. With more time, I could have done a better job. I came back to find totally rewritten from top to bottom. Oh, you know, well, OK, fine, they couldn't get hold of me. And I said, but you can't put my name on that. Oh, no, you've written it. The plan to replace William Hartnell was abandoned, but the Doctor would still be invisible for much of the story, giving the actor another well-deserved holiday. To have his character only being played by his hand was really quite clever. So he wasn't there, and that hand could play the game, the trilogic game. The whole story... So, hmm. I, I pl that was probably a longer clip than I had anticipated, but it just was interesting. so interesting, revolving around... Mm. Now, only, you know, John Wiles' departure, but you had Ennis Lloyd, who didn't want, again, similarly to John Wiles, didn't want the responsibility, didn't want to be mm. the producer, and was kind of forced upon it. To me, the most interesting thing is, is when you, we look back and when we did the Eric comparisons between Ennis Lloyd and Verdi Lambert, I know I came down on the side of Ennis Lloyd being the better producer of the show compared to Verdi Lambert. I can't remember what you guys' uh, thoughts were on the whole thing. But I do remember, just to me, the most amazing thing is, is he didn't want to do it, but when he got the reins, he totally enjoyed every single moment, which to me is the exact opposite of what John Wiles is. Yeah. Yes. position as the producer yeah, was. Yeah. He realised he'd been handed the shitty end of the stick and he turned it round into a twiglet. Yeah. And, you know, he basically went, okay, I, you know, I've got the reins now. I've got a script editor who, you know, sees the same thing as me. Script editors, you know, live in life O'Reilly because he's like, yes, we can turn this into proper sci-fi. Um, let's get a scientific advisor on board, mm. which is what they did. Kit Peddler. I was going to say, and, is, uh, um, you know, are um, Kit Peddler, Jerry Davis, and Innes Lloyd still around? No. No? I don't think so. No, um, no. They died no, long ago, they? mate. Uh, it, to me, again, it, it's, it's amazing because, again, you have John Wiles who, and Innes Lloyd, basically in the same footsteps. And I, the great analogy that you use, Legion, because you could have, like, when John Wiles, when he looks at what he was given with, uh, you know, Doc's master plan, he hated it, washed his hands of it, and just said, "You do your thing. I don't want to do anything revolving around this." Mm. And th again, what to bring back what he even said was, "Hey, I want to go down a darker avenue. Kids like being scared." Well. Apparently, he didn't pay attention to anything that happened to Dalek's master plan. He did, and and he did, I guess, go down a darker avenue with kind of the Myth Makers, the, third, the fourth episode of that, followed by uh, the fourth episode of The Massacre of Bartholomew's Eve. But then we get these light, fluffier stories from the Ark. Even to me, I think the Celestial Toymaker is just way too... Light. I would love to find out Donald Tosh's original idea for the Celestial Toy Maker, mm -hmm. because if it got so disturbing that he had to 
walk away with it or Brian Hales had to walk away from it for a while and then kind of revisit it. Like, what was that story like? Yeah. That's what I mm. want to know. Mm. And then we go back to the campy, over-the-top gunfighters, and then, you know, he ends kind of his run, but he's no longer there with the savages. Mm. So it's quite interesting to see they both were handed the same, like, I guess, unenviable task of replacing somebody, but they both went with it in two different directions. And one basically... And and in in part of it, they did make mention of how things were kind of going down the hill, revolving around um, this you know viewership and stuff like that. However, once the war machines came into play, that kind of gave the show a, an initial bump in in interest, mm. revolving around fans. And mm. again, that is the first thing uh, story that basically Ennis actually had his hands on and and you, you, we go to the smugglers followed by the tenth planet followed by the the power of the Daleks which just just gets better and better the further you get into the Ennis Lloyd reign yeah and mm-hmm. and it, here's a question I'd like you guys to think about the one thing from that clip that really kind of I guess disturbed me was Donald Tosh saying that he never you know, him and uh, Wiles never were cross at each other. They never like had words. They never did this. And to me, you could one could say, okay, well, you had a great relationship. But you know what? When you're working on something and you have contradicting ideas, does that mean that Tosh just rolled over and said, okay, like yeah, or vice versa? Mm. Correct. You know, John Wiles went, oh yeah, all right, do what you want. Pretty much. I mean, and in, in, in just to look at our podcast, I mean, we come up with ideas left and right. We've done a couple of them. We haven't done a couple of them. We've paused on a couple of them. And I, I don't feel as though any feelings have been like necessarily hurt. But you know what? We critically analyze certain things. And if something's not good, I mean, uh, sometimes my favorite is bouncing an idea off of Legion. And Legion will just be like, um, no. <laughs> it's, I'm sorry, it's garbage, and he <laughs> he'll, he'll say it exactly like it is, and it doesn't hurt my feelings. It's just like okay, well, just wanted to throw that past no. you guys, just to just to see. Yeah, and and to me, I feel yeah, as though it no. makes like at least our podcast better being able to do that. And I I in in one world, I you could almost wish that Donald Tosh or John Wiles would have been able to do the same with each other, but I don't think they were like those type of. Those were they're, they're both passive people. No, they they didn't have the right personalities yes, yes. to reflect those those traits. Unfortunately, I feel I feel in certain aspects creativity is enhanced by conflict. You know, so you can you can you know we we could do a podcast where we just go, oh yes that's marvelous oh you know that's marvelous oh yes that's marvelous nothing wrong with it and. We'd lose listeners. It's boring. Because yeah. there's just mm-hmm. nothing. Yeah. If you don't have a contradictory, a yeah. contradictory or differing opinions, it's not enjoyable to listen yeah. to. So there's got to be some, you know. I feel opinions. having a very, very lax personality, which it sounds like John Wiles and Donald Tosh had, doesn't really, uh, doesn't breed the best outcome no and then well and then on at, then you have an actor who you know wants things his way this is his show like you know mm-hmm. william hartnell got, this is his break he you know has been wanting to do something like this his whole career and he's always been you know second fiddle or something like that and now this is his show it's going a certain way and when he doesn't like something you can you can even like harken back to Tom Baker. If Tom Baker didn't like something, they would be like, "Okay, Tom, let's do this." And with William Hartnell, okay, it, and and it, it even shows in the Adventures of Time and Space where you know he's just like, "This is how you pilot the TARDIS," and they're just like, "No," and he goes, "No, no, this is how it's done. Like you mm. can't do it a different way." The, I figured out the logistics of piloting the TARDIS or whatever, and it's just this is his show. 
this is like this. And uh, that's probably why they butted head so much is because he he saw it one way. They're both too passive to say no. So they, I guess, and, and one part that I did cut out of it is the other thing, M- Maureen O'Brien, losing Maureen O'Brien was like massive because she said at one point in time in the interview, he would have spats five times a day and they would turn to her and be and he she would take him aside and she would calm him down and she would talk to him she would like she basically was like you know the doctor whisperer or something like that she would just calm him down to mother. a point where he could yeah exactly mm. and she would he would listen to her they, they I did include the part where Peter Purvis had to do part of that but they they said that it works so much better with Maureen O'Brien and you could almost say Writing Vicky out of the story was a massive mistake. In fact, you know what? You to to have William Hartnell happy and to be able to work with him a lot better. You would have th- thought that you know if you have this great show and you don't have this idea of changing him or whatever, keep the one person that can keep him grounded, and that was Maureen O'Brien. Mm. That was probably the biggest yeah. mistake that the show probably could have done. I mean, basically, it was yeah. just that. He was quite a choleric person. They clearly weren't. They were quite perhaps both phlegmatic in their personalities, and it just it didn't work. Interesting. I mean, I think it would have been interesting to see if if they'd you know handled the Maureen situation better, um, and told Bill, and if she was aware that she was leaving, how he how that would have actually played out on screen in that context. You know, knowing that there was change coming, and they were both prepared for it. It is what it is. I'm going to play this first clip, and this is quite interesting because, uh, again, this is done during the 1986 when the show's future was in question, uh, probably around the Sixth Doctor era. They didn't know if it was going to come back. I believe this is part, during the part of the hiatus. And so the question was posed, do you think Doctor Who should be paused or is it ending? And so here is the panel's discussion revolving around the future of Doctor Who in 1986. And I think it is relevant to our current day questions revolving around the show and the struggle. What do the three of you think about the fact that you you did this series about 20 years ago and maybe it's coming to an end? I I mean, why do you think now it's coming to an end? Have you any ideas on that? Certainly his future isn't as sure as it was five, six years ago. I don't know. I mean, time goes on. I suppose there's an end to it all, isn't there? I think Doctor Who, if it ends in a sort of two or three or four years' time, a show will pick up the mantle in a different form and become Doctor Who again. I think it's just horses for courses, you know. I don't necessarily think it will end. Uh, I think it might be a bit like uh, the mousetrap and just become self-generating, self-perpetuating, you know, that one generation will take over from another. I think this is where I pay enormous credit to the people who laid the foundations that I tried to kick about in my kind of uh, juvenile manner, saying I don't want any of this rubbish. Uh, and I think they, they may not have known what they were doing, but they, by God, they built very soundly. And I think um, it has answered a kind of, if you like, a kind of need, I don't know. Uh, nothing else has really quite touched it on British television. And I don't necessarily think it will end. Um, why it came off the air, I know less about than anybody else here. There may, in fact, be rumours going around today. I don't know um, about why. But I, I think it'll come back and I think it'll go on. And it might disappear from time to time, but I don't see why it should ever disappear forever. When you were producer, lots of companions... Well, yes, two companions died. Was that part of your shake-up as producer? It sounds a bit pretentious. In fact, it's all economics. And who's bringing in the audience? And so I th- the girls were rather on short-term contract, I seem to remember, weren't they? You know, And you tried them out, and the poor loves, if they didn't work, like... Poor Dodo, uh, you know, they were shuffled aside, so you left them on Wimbledon Common or whatever. I think we were just looking for chemistry. Uh, when I came in, the, the two sub-leads were leaving anyway. They were there from your day. Peter yes. Purvis and Morna Peter, uh, uh, Peter came in as a result because the your one was leaving. Well, and the girl was going anyway. Uh, uh, O'Brien? I was rather presented with people were leaving anyway. So I think one sort of took people in on sort of a six-month trial. All right, so what are your thoughts revolving around the... Th- uh, there's two aspects that I want to get to. So there was the uh, show ending aspect, and then um, 
one of the things that he talked about was revolving around, um, you know, the show's economic thing and changing because mm. things are Chemistry. not looking promising. I, and to me, and again, it, it's a conversation that should be looked at for where it's we prepping. are today. Yes. So what are your thoughts? So I think he's absolutely spot on, yeah. you know, in the fact that Doctor Who occasionally needs to go away for a while, but then it will come back. It will never, re- it will never truly die. No, it will, it will yeah. regenerate as it were in a new form. Oh yeah, definitely. With a new generation of producers, script editors, actors, etc., etc. Uh, the economics of the companions leaving. He was he he basically been lambasted with. He got Bill Hartnell, the only original cast member. Uh, Peter Purvis literally came in at the end of the chase and had one story then they went on a six week break and then came in and he was landed with that Warren O'Brien hinting that she was going so he went all right bye but I think he was his own worst enemy because he, he he repeatedly upset the apple cart he went through three companions in 12 weeks three companions, three companions. being Dodo no 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 Warren O'Brien got the sack mm. Adrian Hill Adrian Hill Brett Vion, Gene Marsh. Ah, uh, yeah. And then Dodo. Yep. Who, I, I, you know, I Dodo did, was an I, older. I will say, in, in just defense, so I found an article, and I was going to use a lot of it until um, you sent me the link to the 1986 conference or whatever, uh, Legion. But the, I, I tracked down this 1999 Doctor Who magazine issue number 279 and um I was reading through it because it was uh, the tribute to John Wiles because he had previously passed away uh, about a month earlier and so uh Alan Barnes who was writing for Doctor Who magazine at the time kind of did a memorial re- revolving around his run and you know tried to you know back up somebody who's no longer was no longer with us or whatever but one of the things mm. that he did part it that was different from anything that I've ever heard is he just said Jean Marsh was on her way up she was already an established actor and to expect Jean Marsh to stay on Doctor Who would be something that would you you would not would not have happened so the writing mm. out or getting rid of her as a companion was a necessity and because it wasn't going to happen. Did they have to kill her off? Probably not, but you know what? It it added to at least the Daleks master plan and the grimness mm-hmm. of the Daleks master plan. Mm. Yeah. Here's a question. I, I, I so Talking about this, and I, again, I love what you said, Legion revolving around what um, John uh, Dennis Spooner and John Wiles said in that previous clip. But here's my question. So the show needs to, like you said, maybe regenerate from time to time or whatever. Could you argue that what Chris Chibnall is currently doing with the show is regenerating the show? No. No. No, he's no, not. No, why no. not? What's the, I can what's see the he's, he's, he's taking a tired format. And he's basically running it for all it's worth. He's taking an old pony out and he's running it into the ground. You know, it's almost dead. Flogging a dead horse, yeah, basically. He is. I think it needs to go away for a few years, whether that be five, whether that be 10 years, whatever. Enough years so that the public mind goes away from it and then comes back. I, I think it needs, I think it needs resting. It does. It completely does. It needs resting. It needs oh. to 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 go away, and then to be brought back for a new audience, new eyes, fresh perspective, fresh producer, you know, everything. Yeah. Oh no, I I, I agree. I was just like you know was trying to be a little devil's advocate right there because again, what we got in the wilderness years was a lot of great Doctor Who stuff, even though Doctor Who was not currently on the forefront of 
you know, the British public's mind. You had the virgin novelizations. You can even say to some extent even the BBC books. But to me, the virgin novelizations were where things were like really progressive, really thought through, kind of expanding in the universe. And then in 1999, which, Mm. you know, interesting thing, interestingly, the... um, the Doctor Who magazine that I used to, you know, research John Wiles. First off, I didn't. It did not look like in 1999 Doctor Who magazine was owned by the BBC, like it currently is now. It was owned, was owned by, by Marvel. Marvel Comics. Yeah, mm. and I didn't know wow. that. And second off, and one of the th- interesting things was early on in in the thing, I almost got carried away in reading the actual thing instead of doing what I was going to do and looking at John Wiles as the producer or whatever and the the, memor- the memorial that they did in it. But what was really interesting to me was the second page was talking about, was doing a whole article revolving around new Doctor Who and Big Finish, this thing called Big Finish. And I was like, that's interesting. And then another article that Alan Barnes was writing revolving around Doctor Who magazine was they even mentioned, hey, we've heard your, uh, we've read your messages, we've, we've read your mail, and we understand where we're lacking. We are going to look to improve Doctor Who magazine. You're not going to get that now. It is run by an amorphous axis um, entity that doesn't care. And I think that's kind of Mm -hmm. where we're at right now. We we need a pause on Mm -hmm. everything. Let, you know, the juices kind of ferment or whatever. Let the, the creation kind of commence, especially in this era of the internet where people, like I said in a previous podcast, where there's a Reddit group that are creating like their own series 13. Like, this is amazing. This is kind of the stuff that we need. We Do we need to have mm. Doctor Who? No. no. There are communities that will keep it alive. And when it comes back, there will be much rejoicing. Yeah. You know, take those communities yeah. and get them, and uh, you know, put them on for to, to, to big finish. You know, because that's where I've always said, for the most part, ninety nine point five percent of the time, the Doctor heart of Who Doctor Who lies at Big Finish. Is that yeah? He's at well, Big Finish. Well, look at look at all the stuff that came from the Virgin novelizations. I mean, you have Mark Gatiss that was writing the Virgin novelizations. You have, uh, and I know you know some controversy, but you know you had Gareth Roberts. Mm. who wrote Doctor Who, not only Big Finish stuff, but also New Who stuff. I mean, you had you had RTD? these people during Adam the Barnes. wilderness years. Yeah, RTD. Alan Barnes, you had all these people that were writing things during the wilderness years that are now part of the Doctor Who society. Don't see your name anywhere on any of those things, though, Chris Chibnall, though. Missing that. Mm. But uh, everybody else Ooh, meow. seems to... <laughs> <laughs> so true though i know so true even stephen moffat you know did did stuff for the, the wilderness years didn't he and and various things and oh no and in fact you know again in 1999 the same article that i pulled this is one of those things where i'm just like oh my gosh we need to just randomly go through some like old doctor who magazine archives and find some interesting things because not Mm. only were some of the things that i talked about in there revolving around big finish and you know the letters to the editor and making improvements on the magazine but you know what else was in there they also had in the same magazine they started talking about the uh availability for uh, Curse of the Fatal Death <laughs> was is going to be now available to purchase on VHS, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing! All in one magazine. Not mm-hmm. only am I just trying to find something about Wiles, but we have people, uh, Doctor Who magazine, listening to the the, the writing response. You have Big Finish. This the, there's a whole bunch of articles talking about this grand new thing that's happening. You have some reviews revolving around BBC Books, and then you have the excitement of Stephen Moffat's Curse of the Fatal Death being available to purchase. Hmm. Like everybody was excited. This is the wilderness years. 
And there was so much excitement around Doctor Who. And mm. now all we do is we nitpick and we get on each other. Like I, I mentioned earlier on the news where you have a whole bunch of people that are just like, well, you know, if you could be in the room with Chris Chibnall and give him some feedback. And then, you know, you have some people who are just like, well, I, I just don't think that you're giving proper feedback. In fact, you're just being mean. It's just like, no, mm. that's feedback. Mm-hmm. That's still feedback. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, like I said, I think I think we've reached a point where it just needs to be rested for a while. It really does. Yeah. Ooh. Mm-hmm. I'm going to play this last thing, and then it sounds like we're all about ready to be done with the podcast. Yep. But uh, I'm going to play this last thing. This is very interesting. This is one of the last things that we'll, I'll leave you with. And again, what was talked about in 1986. Oh, hello. Chris Chibnall, BBC. Mm. Go back and listen to some of this stuff because it's interesting. So trouble was when you make a film series. It, I mean, if you're making a sort of an indigenous product, you 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 can cater for one society and one culture. If you make a, a television film series, you know when you make it that you to to break even, you've got to sell to a hundred countries. Uh, and I was attacked once in some sort of periodical for the all my. Uh, television film series pandered to the Americans and I sort of wrote a very long letter saying this is quite untrue that uh, I only pandered to the Americans I pandered to the Japanese and I pandered to the Germans <laughs> and I pandered to the Italians and I, because it's back to what John said it's it's sort of economics and you you have to sort of understand um, that if you go into a sort of, shall we say, a, a sort of Catholic country and a mu- Muslim country and a Hindu country all these uh, sort of hidden things that you one's dealing with, you, you're going to offend somebody. You just, you, it's very hard to, to find that compromise where everybody thinks it's wonderful and it's any good. I mean, the, the reason that, that, that people accuse television that it all looks the same is, is because it, it's, it's, its limitations are put on not by the people who make the television, but are people by the people who watch television. And you... Well, that's 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 what the current run is doing, just pandering to the the SJW woke minority, which is annoying because at the grand scheme of things, they're not the bit massive audience. Nope, they are the audience that yells the loudest. Yep, but they aren't the audience. So you're appeasing the loudest screw and pissing off all the people that are just enjoying it and don't have to and don't don't feel as though they need to complain about it because they're enjoying it. No. So now you're you're fixing it for one audience and Ruining the for rest of the audience. I mean, I, I think it was said perfectly by Dennis Spooner. You know, you're not. Not everybody's going to like the same thing. No. And it, to me, the pr- the interesting thing is, and again, I've watched a couple of, gone through back and watched a couple moments from uh, Nerd Roddick streams, and he admits that, you know, he's going to continue to watch the new series. And I know the reason why he's going to do it is because he's going to make some videos and he's going to make some money off of it. Fair play. I un- I, I get it. But when... You have an audience that has no monetary stake in the thing, and all they're trying to do is change it so that they like it. But the you know the rest of the audience mm. doesn't like it. Mm. That's where my problem is with everything. Yeah, true. Well, we'll see. You know, in the special and series thirteen. Hey. Well, that will conclude episode number 167 of the Dr. Who Lambert podcast. Again, thank you so much for joining us in this podcast. Again, uh, we did t- talk on, touch on some very sensitive subjects. You know, Again, depending on what your feelings are revolving around the current or modern era, as well as kind of comparing it to what happened with John Wiles. I hope you've enjoyed the, con- the conversation that we've had. We'd love to hear your feedback. Again, email the show, tweet the show. You can tweet the show, DM it at... Alambra podcast. You can email the show at alambraaudio at gmail.com. What are your thoughts on some of our things re- revolving around John Wiles and again comparing them a little bit to Chris Chibnall? There was, I will tell you, a lot of clips. I will tell you, I found actually more than 
we what we actually played for, but because of uh, time constraints as well as perhaps running into com some copyright issues, um, we decide I decided to just kind of hold back. And if you're like, oh wow, that you you held back, yes, I held back. So uh, I hope that you'd also come and uh, pr listen to some of our previous podcasts. Some of our era comparisons, the second ever era comparison that we did was episode 84, where we looked at Verdi Lambert versus Ennis Lloyd. Again, skipping over John Wiles because we weren't quite sure what we had with John Wiles and perhaps he was like less than interesting. Again, I felt found him fascinating. We've also done a JNT versus Stephen Moffat era, as well as, you know, we, revisiting some classic eras, you know, the highlights and lowlights of the first Doctor and second Doctor era. Please check out our previous catalog as well as I hope you look forward to just as much as we do what we have coming up. We have the third Doctor, highs and lows, that we're going to be talking about soon. We are going to be doing some more Big Finish stuff. We have some holiday seasonal things that uh, at least we found some enjoyment doing and uh, I, I'm very impressed with uh, how they've been received. I mean, it's only been out that not that long, and we got massive uh, downloads. Uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, please subscribe, download, and uh, give us a, a feedback, some five-star five reviews. Thank you for listening to the podcast. And, uh, well, we will see you in time and in 2021. You have been listening to the Doctor Who Alhambra podcast. Doctor Who is owned and trademarked by the BBC. Doctor Who Alhambra is not affiliated with the BBC or Big Finish. No infringement is intended. Visit our website at alhambrapodcast.weebly.com or email the show at alhambraaudio at gmail.com. Tweet us at alhambrapodcast. That is A-L-H-A-M-B-R-A podcast. Thank you.